So he shortened it to Messy Church. And it's my prayerful hope that this message speaks to you today and that you find it meaningful. And one thing I want to point out as I begin, that I'm going to be talking about the church. And church. This is not St. Mark specifically, nor is St. James specifically. This is the grander church, the bigger church, church with a capital C. Uh, and... and so I, I want you to listen to this with that in mind as we picture in our minds the grander or bigger narrative, the bigger story. There's a phrase that many of us might be familiar with. Perhaps you've heard it. It's been around for many years and it's called hot mess. Have you ever heard of that hot mess? Do you know where it originated from? Back in the 19th century? Hot mess? Well, it, it originated in military terms. Uh, and it, it referred to food. Uh, like a mess kit or a mess hall. And so if you had a hot mess, that means you had a hot meal. And then in the uh, uh, 20th century... Hot mess is still found to be part of our uh, vocabulary, but it no longer referred specifically to food, but now it means a very dangerous situation. Still had military origins. So you could be under live fire, or your squad could be in a firefight. And it was a hot mess. They were in a hot mess. And as you get to the 21st century, with the evolution of the word Hot, hot mess now means an attractive disaster. <laughs> Someone whose life is in obvious disarray and yet they remain somewhat functional and somewhat attractive. You've heard of that. People who are just a hot mess or the situation is just a, a hot mess. An attractive disaster. They still show up. They still get the job done. And they look much better than their circumstances really are. And we might think, well, that's my life's goal. <laughs> right? To show up, to get it done, and look much better than my life's circumstances really are. Regardless of what's going on in our lives, or what's going on at home, you show up at work, you show up at school, you smile, you're pleasant. And when you come to church, that's what you see row after row of smiling, pleasant people. And it seems like everyone is happier than you are. Everyone has control of their life. All is going just great for everyone else. When in reality, what you see is row after row of hot messes. <laughs> because we all have a mess somewhere in our lives. We just clean up good. <laughs> That's the definition of a hot mess. Our messes can be different from person to person. We might have a financial mess. Oh boy, I've, I've maxed out all seven of my credit cards. I don't know what I'm going to do now. Or, or a physical mess. I just can't believe how I've let myself go. I am just a physical mess. Or a mess at work. They're talking about layoffs. Maybe permanently. Academic mess. School is just so hard. Our spouse is a mess. Our home life is a mess. Our family is a mess. Life around us is a mess. Sometimes we find ourselves one decision away from creating a whole new mess for ourselves. I heard it stated as one dumb decision. We're one dumb decision away from creating a whole new mess for ourselves. And the point is that no matter where we are, whether we're Christians following Christ, or we're not sure about religion, but that Jesus guy sounds okay, or we're seeking answers, or we're walking this fine line, this, this tightrope, if you will, from just giving up on everything or responding to Jesus' call 
in our lives. We're teetering. Which way do we go? No matter where we are, who we are, the thing that we all have in common is that life is just messy. <laughs> Sometimes it's messy because we create the mess. Sometimes we inherit a mess. Sometimes we're just going about our daily business, our daily thing, you know, day-to-day -day life, and we look around us suddenly and say, oh my gosh, everything's a mess. It catches up. It sneaks up on us. But there's good news. There's good news. Because <laughs> we need good news. The good news, there's always someone whose life is a bigger mess than yours. <laughs> there's always someone worse off than you. You can take great comfort in knowing. Well, that's not really good news. That's not good news. Uh, we all live in messes, uh, sometimes of our own creation, sometimes not. Uh, and to, to uh, point out someone else's bigger mess. That's, uh, we're, we're not trying to glorify or, um, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, glorify or exemplify or, or lift up other people's messes to make us feel better. We don't want to do that. The good news is really this. It's not just you. You're not alone. It's not just you. You're not alone. It's not just your marriage. It's not just your health. It's not just your life. It's not just your GPA. <laughs> We're all in the middle of some mess. And mess is what brings us together today. Our lives are messy. And, and at the very least, some of us are here to find answers to this mess we live in. And when we look around this morning, we see people sitting in front of us and behind us and to the side of us. And everyone looks good and smiles good and smells good and dresses up good. And that's just what we see on the outside. But keep in mind, we all have messes in our lives. Now here's why it's important to, to know this. When we see someone else's mess, when we see someone about to make a decision and we just know, we just know they're going to regret it. Oh, if you continue to live that way, if you continue to talk to your spouse that way, if you continue to talk to your kids that way, if you continue to make those unhealthy decisions, you're going to create a mess. Have you been there? You ever looked at someone else's lifestyle and oh, <laughs> you're a hot mess. You're just making decisions. And you know what? I'm just the person to tell you so. Before you're critical, you need to remember that you're a mess as well. And when it comes to someone else's mess, we should be students, not critics. And what I mean by that is that as a student, we sit down and try to learn more about the other person to learn or hear more about their context, to learn about them and their life and what's going on. We, we, we all know that when we hear someone's story, when you know their background or their context, you begin to see that person differently. When you get to know that person on a personal level, you see them differently. And isn't it true that once we know their story, we lose that edge of castigation, we become em empathetic and sympathetic uh, with them and the mess that they find themselves in? There's a number of nationwide surveys and, and uh, conversations and studies that address the problem of the dying church today. And, and when I say dying church, keep in mind what I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm not talking about St. Mark's. Because I think we are a healthy church. 
And when we have our, our little ones here, whether they're crying, making the sweet sound of music through their tears, or our kids young at heart, or us older, young at heart. I'm talking about the big church, the nationwide church. And as I said, there's sur surveys and studies and conversations that talk about the dying church. One of them is this model, one of the reasons why is this model of criticism that Christians sometimes live out. We, we tend to critique more than try to understand. Maybe you or, or someone that you know has decided not to go to church. Or, or you've just shut down the whole religion thing. And, and it's because in the middle of your own mess you found yourself among some Christians who were so critical of you. They didn't listen to your story. They didn't want to know your story. They didn't ask to know more about you. They had no compassion. And you thought to yourself, well, if this is what it means to be a Christian, <laughs> then forget it. We, the church, have been more critical and less compassionate. We've spent less time getting to know their story and putting ourselves in their shoes and more time asking ourselves or even them, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you saying this, acting like this, being this in ways that we think they should be? Now we can own that, right? We can own that we do that as a church. Jesus had a lot to say about being compassionate and not critical. He said in one conversation with his disciples, he said, before you can take the splinter out of, your eye, out of their eye, you need to take the log out of yours. You can't judge someone else's mess because you're in a mess. And you've been in messes in the past. Sometimes we make a mess that we can't get ourselves out of. And it's a reminder that we really, really need the help of others. And, and because we've all been in those holes that we've dug so deeply for ourselves that we look up and say, I can't, I can't believe here's where I am. And if you've ever had someone reach out to you in that moment to help you out of that hole, to, to listen to you, to uh, want to know more about your story and who you are. Someone who wants to help you uh, when you've made a mess of things. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that that's supposed to be our response to people. If we as Christians... And we as the church act in this way. How much more do you think the good news of Jesus Christ might be shared across the nation? How many more people would want to come to know him better? To know him more deeply? How many more people would give their, their lives to Jesus? Well, there's one last thing I want to talk about this morning, and this is to help set up next week, because we're doing a little bit of a series here on, on messy. Uh, and it's, it's this. The mess that brings us together is the mess that draws God near. The mess that brings us together is the mess that draws God near. Think about this. Hebrews tells us that God moved from prophets to the Son to speak to the people. Jesus, the good news, the Word of God. <laughs> For God so loved this mess. For God so loved the messy world. For God so loved the messy people of the world. <laughs> Red and yellow, black and white were all messes in His sight. <laughs> gospel is all about God looking down on this messy world and saying well I don't think I'm going to flood it this time I'm not going to burn it up I think, I think I'll send my son to address this mess 
And this was such a surprise to the people. And one of the reasons that they didn't recognize him for who he, who he was, who he is, is because they expected God to send judgment to punish them, to hit them with a lightning bolt from the sky. Someone to castigate, to criticize, to make them feel worse than they already did. And when Jesus showed up, he introduced something into the messes of the world. Something so astounding, so foreign to people that they didn't quite get it. Jesus introduced grace. God brought grace into the world. Grace is something that we can't earn. We can't be good enough for it. It's a gift given to us freely by God. That gift has already been paid for. It's been paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross who died for all our sins. No one expected that from God. No one saw it coming and most people missed it. If you're one of those persons in a mess, know that you are surrounded by hot messes. <laughs> you are not alone. And know that the gospel is for you. The heart of the gospel is that Jesus came into the world. Not just for the sake of it or because he felt sorry for but, but that Jesus came into the world because of the messiness of the world. God brought us grace. Well, next week we're going to take another look at messy. Uh, and, and, and we're going to use this phrase to start us off. Nobody's perfect. If I heard that one before, nobody's perfect. That'll help kick off the message for next week. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, heavenly God, gracious God, God almighty, God loving, God caring, God giving, God of compassion and grace, thank you for sending your son to us. We know our lives around us are sometimes messy. We know we are sometimes messy. We know the church is messy because it's made up of messy people. But Lord, that doesn't stop us from loving you. In fact, it encourages us to love you because we know that we can't do this on our own. We can't fix our own mess on our own. We can't climb out of that deep, deep hole without some help. So we give thanks to you, O God Almighty, for your Son, Jesus Christ, this good news. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now is the time for our offering and our ushers are going to come around with our offering plates and I want to thank you ahead of time for your generosity and your grace in giving back of what God has given to you.
friends, would you pray with me our prayer of dedication and thanksgiving? Generous God, we ask you to bless these gifts this morning. We ask that you help grow the trust in us so that we might follow without looking back and we might leave behind more of our old lives to experience more deeply a new life in you. In the name of Christ, who goes before us and beside us, we pray. Amen. Let's take a little bit of time for prayer. And uh, at this time, I want to extend an invitation if there are any prayer concerns or praise, joy, celebrations that you would like to lift up this morning. Uh, I'll, I'll share one, and this is from Joanne Grant. Uh, her sister-in-law, Janet Rooker, passed away on Friday. So we keep her in prayers. Friends, then, let's uh, take this moment and share with our Lord Jesus Christ that which is on our hearts in a moment of silent prayer. <laughs> 